Hello, welcome to the Deep and Durable Learning Podcast. This is the show for anyone who's struggled with the superficiality and short half-life of what passes for education. I'm Mike Gray, and I'm transitioning from nearly 45 years as a professor in higher education into this role of podcast host. This show is not primarily about bemoaning the state of education. Instead, I'll offer a positive, practical vision of how your learning can become both deep and durable. Welcome back to Season 2 of the Deep and Durable Learning Podcast. I hope you had a joyous holiday season shared with family and friends. We spent the first season of this podcast exploring what it means to know, or to use the 25-cent word, epistemology. If the goal is deep learning, we must know what deep learning looks like. And simply put, deep learning settles for nothing less than understanding. Collecting information and repeating it is not learning. Anyone can do that, and most people do that, without any real understanding. Asking the average person for evidence and logic to back up their position is tantamount to picking a fight, although it shouldn't be. Justified true belief is the time-honored standard for real knowledge, and we established that in the first season. If you missed some or all of the first season, I recommend you go back and fill in the gaps so that we will be on the same page this season. This season we'll be exploring another foundational question for learning. What do we know about how the brain learns? And the corollary question, how can we use the knowledge we have about the brain to improve the learning experience? The brain, the human brain I'm referring to, is an impressive organ. Weighing in at three pounds and protected by the bones of our skull, The brain is the center of our cognitive activity, to to be sure, but also our emotional life in the main. The journal Neuron, in the June 7, 2017 issue, put it this way, the brain is an efficient and robust adaptive learner, an efficient and robust adaptive learner. The authors go on to say, the brain is a hugely complex, highly recurrent, and non-linear neural network. This network is surprisingly plastic and sustains our amazing capability for learning from experience and adapting to new situations. Now, I could take that quotation apart, but suffice it to say that um, the authors are impressed with the brain, and secondarily, that the brain is not acting like a computer. Computers follow linear language sequences, that is, the code that they're responding to. The brain, in contrast, is a non-linear neural network. Non-linear means parallel processing, not linear processing. And recurrent neural networks, the brain is highly recurrent, maintain the sequence of the input data throughout the cognitive process. More to our discussion today would be the question, Initially, can the brain understand the brain? Can the human brain understand the human brain? That's a philosophical question. And I think the obvious answer is no. Understanding requires a 
position above that integrates a number of particulars into a coherent whole. And as humans, we're limited to a human perspective of the brain. Nonetheless, neuroscience attempts in the main to give mechanist or even reductionist explanations for how the brain functions. That is how the brain's electrical activity, anatomical divisions, um, neuronal sim synapses, and uh, on a variety of other levels, can we um, come up with a material explanation of the phenomenon of the human brain uh, learning or reacting to stimuli. The brain is an extremely protected organ within the skull. Um, it's the center of what we experience as consciousness. Uh, in many ways, uh, we would feel that whoever we are resides in our skull, in our brains. The brain uh, is active all the time, whether we're awake or asleep, and neural processing is extremely costly, taking approximately 20% of all the calories that we consume to sustain our neural processing. Another way of saying that, because uh, energy is consumed through uh, a process that uses oxygen, is the brain is a major consumer of oxygen. Uh, we breathe, and uh, the brain needs to continually be supplied with sufficient oxygen in order to uh, maintain its functioning at a healthy level. I mean, consider the outcome for someone who has, as a result of an accident, let's say, stopped breathing. What we fear most is we fear that prolonged stoppage of breathing will damage the brain. So the brain gets preferential treatment in, in many ways because of its executive role in uh, governing our actions, our thoughts, our emotions, as well as what we do, what it appears we're acting out. The brain is not a computer. Uh, by some measures, the brain is inferior to a computer. For instance, as a database for information, the, the brain has a bottleneck that we'll, we'll talk about in a subsequent broadcast. But uh, brains, as, as you're no doubt aware from, say, doing a Google search uh, that comes up with probably millions of items for many common Google searches in a fraction of a second, the, the brain is a poor comparator. On the other hand, as a pattern recognition device, the brain is excellent. The brain is unsurpassed, we could say, as a pattern recognition device, uh, unsurpassed by computers, unsurpassed by artificial intelligence. In fact, it's interesting that artificial intelligence employs some of the same framework that the human brain uses in an attempt to achieve brain-like uh, processing and uh, the ability to recognize patterns would be part of that brain-like processing. When we look at what the inputs into the brain are, the senses, five senses and however many others there, there may be that are difficult to uh, articulate and not necessary for this podcast anyway, the brain is continually bombarded with sensory input during our waking hours, uh, enough that uh, if we paid attention to it all, we'd blow a fuse, as it were. But the brain is engineered in such a way that it ignores or forgets 
the vast majority and uh, rules it out as irrelevant or unimportant. Most of what the brain does not ignore is processed and uh, discarded during a process uh, during our sleep called consolidation. So the vast majority of what the brain uh, is potentially exposed to is forgotten and discarded. And we'll circle back around to that a bit later, and that has important ramifications for learning. The brain uh, has been studied at many different levels, and one of the ways in which it's been studied most recently is uh, on the level of its uh, neural anatomy. Brain anatomy is, is studied by various kinds of imaging techniques. The brain, um, as it were, is viewed as having a wiring diagram that needs to be discerned through imaging techniques of various sorts. And a number of those have been developed in the last 10 to 12 years. Uh, one of them is small f MRI. Most of you know what an MRI is. And a functional MRI uh, allows uh, imaging while the individual is going about certain kinds of tasks, usually cognitive or sensory tasks. And there are other kinds of imaging techniques as well. I'm not going to overwhelm you with uh, labels. I've decried in a previous episode the vocabulary orientation, and I'm going to steer away from that in the main during this particular podcast as well. But a little bit of what the wiring diagram might consist of. Of course, there aren't wires in the brain. Instead, there are neurons, estimate of 100 billion neurons, that uh, synapse on the average with uh, 10,000 or so synaptic connections. It's a space in between neurons where they can potentially communicate by means of uh, chemical substances called neurotransmitters. So what that amounts to is 100 billion times 10,000 connections apiece means we're looking at uh, 1,000 trillion connections that would come up in the wiring diagram. Suffice it to say that the Human Connectome Project, which uh, began in 2010, um, did not begin to scratch the surface of the wiring diagram that this so-called connectome would employ. It was an ambitious effort, to put it mildly, and most of what it did was to uh, refine the neuroanatomy of the brain. But frankly, what most of us are interested in is not the anatomy, but the physiology of brains. Uh, how do brains do what they do? And, um, you know, in, in theory, anatomy would go all the way down to individual neurons and the other neurons that they synapse with. And we're nowhere close to that level of uh, understanding at this point. Brain mapping, which um, no doubt is uh, important, um, is just one small piece of what we need to know to have a better understanding of brain function, brain physiology. Uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, a psychologist at Northeastern University, put it this way in talking about brain mappers. They parse the brain in terms of what they're interested in psychologically or mentally or behaviorally, and then they assign the functions to different networks of neurons as if they're Lego blocks, as if there are firm boundaries there. Implication, in her quote, that perhaps that's the wrong way of looking at it. And indeed, she continues, quoting here, scientists for over 100 years have searched fruitlessly for brain boundaries between, and now we're on the functional level again, between thinking, feeling, deciding, 
remembering, moving, and other everyday experiences. So these studies, she says, are, for all their uh, sophistication as imaging advances, they are poor guides for understanding how brains are structured or how they work. Uh, another neuroscientist, um, Georgi Buzaki, who's at New York School of Medicine, New York University School of Medicine, says that we divide the real estate of the brain according to our preconceived ideas, assuming, wrongly as far as I'm concerned, that those preconceived ideas have boundaries and the same boundaries exist in brain function. So in other words, we have our categories as owners of human brains, uh, the ways in which we have broken out the functionality of the brain, and then we try and find those same preconceived categories in uh, studies of uh, neural imaging. What we have found with things like F-functional MRI is there's an unexpected overlap in terms of the regions involved in various mental activities. And uh, that's been confusing to people who um, had preconceptions that involved more compartmentalization than the imaging studies seem to reveal. The other way, besides imaging, that we've learned about some structures historically is when someone has brain damage, when the structures, a particular structure is damaged and it ceases to function properly. So for instance, uh, our knowledge about a structure that's found in each of the hemispheres called the hippocampus, so we have hippocampi, uh, the hippocampus, when damaged, memory is severely affected. But more recent studies have shown there's not just memory that's involved, that the hippocampus gets called on for activities that don't involve memory. So that's an example, both of how we come to understand something and of what happens when we get too wedded to that structure as the home for some particular function. Another thing we can say about the brain um, is that the brain does not record events. All this sensory input, as we've said, most of it gets uh, discarded. We choose to ignore it, uh, but it encodes events in networks of relevant ideas. So um, we reconstruct events through putting ideas together that evoke the event. And uh, so when you're remembering something, you're not actually playing it back, even if it's uh, something you've got a almost photographic image in your mind about. Still, it's uh, the result of reconstructing the event through retrieval of relevant ideas that were invoked during that event. So the construction of conceptual frameworks um, is key to uh, our ability to reconstruct events. Let me say here, too, it's been implicit in what I've said so far, that there's a significant lack of overlap between various disciplines like neuroscience, psychology, learning theory, molecular biology, which would operate at the level of nerve impulse conduction and neurotransmitter action at synapses. The lack of overlap means we don't have coherence. We don't have integration. And that's a huge problem. So there tends to be um, a private, discipline-specific set of concerns and even of, of language that uh, keeps us from talking to one another and keeps the uh, individuals involved uh, in their own little silos rather than working together to create something that has unity. We, in this 
series this season, we'll be talking about uh, learning that cooperates with the brain. How do we structure learning in such a way that it cooperates with the brain? Because frankly, most of learning does not cooperate with the way the brain is structured. I'm looking at a book on my desk, for instance, uh, that's called The Brain-Targeted Teaching Model, which is somewhat of a wry title, and I don't think the author intended it to be wry, but uh, I mean, aren't we teaching to brains? Aren't brains the only way that we could possibly learn? And yet, the individual author here seems to be talking about uh, something new, targeting the brain. And uh, so indeed, it's somewhat of a backhanded way of saying that uh, we haven't done that in the past. The evidence we've used in the past of learning is that memory is the endpoint that we're trying to get to. And so rather than constructing memory in a way that's taking advantage of the brain's strengths, we take shortcuts such as mnemonic devices to get there, to force the brain to hold on to things that it's in danger of losing. And indeed, many of you have felt the slipping away of content from a course at a, the minutes just before or even during the the taking of a test. In contrast, uh, brains are wonderful at, at discerning patterns, and patterns are the basis for forming concepts. And concepts and their linkage together is the basis for understanding that then results in memory. So there's a longer process, but the memory, memory result that we desire comes about and the, the memory is durable. So this podcast is called Deep and Durable Learning. And the learning is durable because it's deep, because it focuses on conceptualization and understanding. So that's what I'm really interested in. I'm, I'm pragmatic when it comes to using brain science to improve learning. And I thought I'd just take these remaining few minutes here to uh, give you a sense of where we're headed during this season. Uh, I envision probably nine episodes, eight after this one. And uh, the way the season breaks out is it turns out that there are seven C's. That's the letter C. So seven C's of our season on cognition. We could call it sailing the seven C's, if you don't mind a horrible pun. Um, I am not one of those individuals who tries to put together mnemonic devices, but uh, this just distilled out very naturally as I was planning the season. So um, not in the exact order that we're going to consider them, but let me just tell you what the seven C's of cognition are. And the first one is curiosity. And then we've talked today about concept formation, which is conceptualization. And then our brains are limited in certain ways that must be taken into account if we're not going to overwhelm them in unproductive ways. I'm not talking about rigor. Uh, I'm talking about ignoring um, anatomical and physiological limits. So another C is cognitive load. And maybe that one's cheating on the C, but it does, does start with C. And then something called chunking, which is the way our brain puts together ideas as chunks. And then creativity, connectivity, and finally, consolidation which is when the brain prunes out the excess and uh, makes stronger logical connections about what we have learned. Uh, usually in the last uh, however many hours we've been awake and consolidation occurs then while we're asleep. So that's the overview of this 
season, and I hope you'll join me for this voyage on the seven seas as we sail through the concepts associated with cognition. In two weeks, we'll consider curiosity. Curiosity may have killed the cat, but curiosity fuels the student. Without curiosity, information and sensory stimuli are ignored and forgotten. Learning is short-circuited unless the student is curious. And I hope you're curious to learn about curiosity in two weeks. <laughs>